In this video, we're going to be talking about potential energy curves. And what we mean by that is, let's go for an example. So first off, the potential energy due to gravity is mgh, and that is gravity. And so what this means is that as I increase my position, my potential energy also increases linearly. So when I double my height, I double my potential energy. However, what if you have something else that doesn't behave like this? For example, um, if you have a molecular bond, it's entirely possible that if you have some sort of intermolecular bond, that the potential energy between the two objects looks more like this something strange like that. And so, where as you change the distance between the two objects, the potential energy first goes down, then it goes back up. So the question is, how do things behave? How do objects behave when you have a potential energy uh, that's of this shape? And this is going to be very important uh, when you're, specifically when you're thinking about uh, quantum mechanics, when you're thinking about molecular bonds, and uh, when you're talking about uh, potentials and oscillators and things like that. So now we can work this out mathematically. So recall that we said uh, when we were discussing gravitational potential energy that the change in potential energy is equal to minus the work. And the reason that we said that it's minus the work is that as you take an object and raise it so it's higher than it was before, gravity is doing negative work. And that's because gravity points down and you're moving up, so f dot ds is negative. And so we wanted to, we wanted to represent this as being, uh, as you increase the height, you're increasing the potential energy. You're essentially uh, putting energy into the gravitational field, which then if you let go of the object and it falls downward, it's going to be returned to you as kinetic energy. So that's where the negative sign comes from. But we say that the change in potential energy is minus the work, or it's minus the integral of f ds. And this is all in one dimension, just for convenience. And so um, what we can do is take the differential of this, and we can say dPe is equal to minus f ds. So the change in potential energy is equal to minus the force times the displacement. And then what we can do is then rewrite this as an expression for the force. Where the force is equal to minus the change in potential energy ds with respect to position. And so um, this has some really interesting implications. And so first, let's work it out for a couple of examples. And so the simplest one is gravity. And potential energy is just equal to mgh. And we're going to just call it mgs. And so for convenience. And so the force for gravity is minus dPe ds. And if you look at this expression, it says minus, it becomes minus mg. So in other words, our expression for potential energy, when you take the derivative with respect to position, just gives us the force of gravity acting on an object. And then we can do the same thing with a spring. And so if you, uh, in class, we derived the force of a spring and the potential energy, uh, I'm sorry, the potential energy of a spring. And so that's equal to one half k x squared, or delta x squared. And so we can take the derivative of this as well, and I'm just going to write the force as minus dPe dx in this case to keep our notation constant. And when I take uh, the derivative of 1 half kx squared, that's just kx, so I get a minus kx, which returns us, uh, which returns Hooke's law. And so the key point here is that if we have some arbitrary potential, then the force points essentially downhill. It's going to uh, point an object in the direction of the minimum of potential energy. So the force is in the direction 
of decreasing potential energy. And so the way to think about that in terms of springs is that it tries to return to the equilibrium and in terms of gravity that it tries to take you to the minimum, uh, the absolute minimum place possible, the lowest energy spot. So let's look at this for some potential with an arbitrary shape. And this is very, very useful for modeling the behavior of structures at the molecular level or when you're talking about things that oscillate. And we'll come to that later on in the semester. But first, let's look at this graph. So what we're plotting here is the energy of a system as a function of its position. And so that's some arbitrary direction. And so this blue curve here represents some arbitrary potential. And when we talk about a potential energy that's not necessarily gravitational or something, we often choose to say that it has a potential energy of U, which means that we don't know what it depends on. It, dep you know, it depends on position, but it might be mass, it might be a spring constant, who knows? And so in this case, the total energy, E total, of your system, so if we had a particle or a, something oscillating back and forth, is just going to be the, uh, the kinetic energy of that object plus its potential energy at some position x. And we know that the potential energy is going to be conserved. And so what that means is that if we have an object that starts out at some energy, let's just say right here, then that, and it's sitting still, then that means that that is the total energy in the system. And if you recall, the force is going to be in the direction to minimize the energy. So it's going to be minus du dx in this case. So if I'm here at this point that I've just indicated, then the force that I am going to feel is going to try to push me to the right. So in other words, it's going to try to push me down this potential energy. Uh, down, down the path of potential energy. And so, assuming energy is conserved, then what's going to happen is that I will oscillate between this point and over to the other position that's at the same potential energy and back and forth. And it is just going to oscillate back and forth. And again, uh, this is going to be very, very useful when we start talking about uh, what goes on at the molecular level and when we talk about oscillators. So now we can explore this further by uh, putting up a potential graph and asking how particles released at different points would behave. And so this is a graph just like the last one where the blue line is the potential energy as a function of position, the y-axis shows the total energy, and the x-axis shows position. And so I've labeled a bunch of different points here, x1 through x6. And what we want to know is how a particle released here, here, and here would behave. But first, it's worth taking a look at the sort of general behavior of this graph. And so recall that the force that an object experiences is going to be minus du dx. And so this is uh, pushing you in the direction of decreasing potential energy. So for example, if we were at point x1, this is going to push us down towards x. And in fact, a good analogy for potential energy would be a hill, right? So if you were at the top of a hill, you want to roll towards the bottom of the hill. And so the two points, at the points at the bottom of all of the potentials so that would be this point, this point, and this point uh, are at a potential minimum where the force drives you to that. And these are all stable equilibria. And so the way to think of that is they're stable because if you placed something at, say, this point right here and gave it a little push, it would only oscillate back and forth in that tiny little region right there. However, if you consider the points at the tops of the hills up here, 
then these are unstable equilibria. And we say equilibrium because the derivative at those points is zero, both the stable ones down here and the unstable ones up here. But with the unstable ones, if you give them a tiny nudge to either side, they're going to take off down our potential hill. And so, in general, if we were to place an object at some point at rest, it would start moving towards the local potential minimum. But when it gets to that local potential minimum, if it has any kinetic energy at all, it's going to continue back up the other side. So, coming back to our original question, let's deal with our particles uh, in reverse order. So we're going to start with particle x3. If I place particle x3 at this position with no kinetic energy at rest, then it's simply going to sit there because any force that would be acting on it would drive it to that point, and right there it's at the bottom of the potential well. So it's simply not going to go anywhere, so at point x3 it's just going to sit there at rest. So now point x2, if we put something at point x2, it is going to head down towards the potential minimum at point 3, and then back up, and then it will reach the same total potential energy on the other side, where its kinetic energy will be zero. And so what it's going to do is oscillate back and forth between point x2 and point x4. So if I release it at point x2, at rest, it oscillates back and forth between x2 and x4. Now finally, if I talk about point x1, something released at rest at point x1, well, it is going to head down the slope towards point x3, the potential minimum, but it's going to have, by the time it gets there, it's going to have a huge amount of kinetic energy, and it's going to go back up the slope, and it's going to end up moving all the way down in position until it reaches a potential energy that's just as high, so the kinetic energy is going to be equal to zero, because remember, kinetic energy is, cons uh, en total energy is conserved, I'm sorry. So, it will oscillate back and forth between point x1 and point x6.